Shalom. Shalom. We are uh, Parshat Vayikra here. It's March the 7th, 2022. What I want to say is that um, this is an extraordinarily difficult Parsha. It's an extraordinarily difficult book. Um, and I'll make the case for Vayikra being the, um, because it's at the center of the Torah. I want to make the claim that it's the most important book and it contains at its core, the central features of, of certainly biblical Israel and certainly Judaism, what will then become, of course, the Judaism we live now. But uh, it's so hard and we say this all the time, it's so hard to enter into this world because the world of Vayikra is a much different world from our world. Um, just to put you into the context of this world, we have just completed, as you saw last week, the construction of the tabernacle. It was an important event, really extraordinary event uh, in the, the cycle, not the cycle, in the, in the, the, the timeline of Israel, having uh, been released from slavery, having gone through the Red Sea, having gone up the mountain or received the, you know, God's um, statements from the mountain and all of the terror and uh, difficulty of that, the shattering of the tablets and the refashioning of the tablets, and then uh, several months of preparation of the sanctuary, all of which coincides with the anniversary of the first month of the Exodus. It's the the, the first day of the first month, all of that is completed. Um, so it's been a it's been a great year for the biblical Israel, and now God is speaking from the the sanctuary to Moses, and I know that there are lots and lots of lovely, gorgeous, and beautiful interpretations of of even the first sentence, and and you know the the phenomenon of a tiny Aleph there, which has lots and lots of meaning, but I'm not going to get into any of that because the content of the first chapter and the subsequent chapters for the first seven chapters of the book deal with a world that is so far removed from us. And then I say is, is not um, as far as we think that all of the themes that are related specifically to sacrifice are themes that are found uh, at the very core of hum, human existence, it's it's basic to our lives. That that may seem so odd, okay, in the sense that uh, the last thing that I probably want to do ever is to take a lamb and slaughter it, skin it, uh, cut it into pieces, pile it into a pile put it on an altar, flame it up, uh, and stand there, okay? It's probably the last thing that I want to do. But but I want to approach the text with the same level of devotion, love, and, and curiosity as I would approach any of the other texts, which, which is to ask, well, what's going on here? And and the driving story in all of the study is, what's the story behind the, the story in this case, it's what's the law behind the, what's the story behind the rules? And what's the matrix of ideas? What are the values here? What are the concepts that are playing out here? And there's no consensus about this. It's complicated. Scholars are divided. And, and the research and the, the thinking about the book of Leviticus um, is really only beginning to kind of mature. Scholars themselves have not really focused on this book um, very much. You know, we we because it's easier it's easier to to talk about characters. It's easier to talk about story, and and to and to identify with the characters and their challenges. It's much more difficult to identify, as I just uh, expressed. You know the worshiper coming to the uh, to the sanctuary or to the uh, temple and offering a sacrifice. It's very very difficult. I, I want to just um, uh, you know illustrate this with with just a useful table here. I just came up with this table. 
and that is basically here. The, you know, it's a different book. It's static. It's law. There's a different kind of reading. It requires a different kind of imagination. In Breshit and Shmot, we all we had narrative story in Vayikra. It's mostly law. There are you know one or two little stories in in the entire book. There's a lot of movement in a lot of action in Genesis and Exodus. Here it's there's very little action. It stays in one place. In Breshit and Shmot, there's a lot of geography. You move from uh, Ur Kazdim to Canaan to Mitzrayim. Back to Canaan, to you know, and and inside Canaan, and then you know, when you once you get to Jacob, it's back to Haran, back to Egypt, and out of Egypt. There's there's just a lot of movement going on in the book of book two books of Breshit and uh, Shmon, and then of course we could we could start you know with the arc, uh, the narrative arc from the very beginning of the Torah. You know, God, what is God doing in uh, at the beginning? God is taking the whole of everything, all the primordial soup of of matter, and chopping it up, making divisions, divisions of you know uh, land and water, day and night, um, uh, life and everything else, uh, and all sorts of different categories of living things, etc. And so creation then is the process of making a new whole out of something that that starts and then what we've been talking about over the last few weeks which is that it all reaches to this climactic moment where god breaks through from beyond matter reality everything and comes with a covenant okay and so i would say that vayikra it's it's really and I, I'm, I know that this is a bit of art, artifice, but, but it works, which is human beings order reality in ritual. One of the important things about ritual is that ritual puts a structure on our reality. And in the course of that reality, we break through to God. So the dynamic going on in the Bible is... I could put it in, in one sentence, which is God wants to reach to human beings and human beings want to reach to God. I mean, that, 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 I don't know if it's trivializing it, but, but if you want to kind of sum it up in one sentence, that's what's happening. God creates a world, wants to break through to humanity, and humanity wants to break through to God. Both entities, human beings and God, are so ultimately different and apart from each other, and yet there, there needs to be this kind of, you know, uh, line of continuity between the two or, or what, you know, religious texts call the bridge, the bridge between God and human beings, which is reflected, at least in the biblical Israel, in the form of worship or sacrifice, okay? So I like this writer, Yitzhak Feder, he's a young scholar, and, he, and I quoted him last year when I talked about smicha, putting your hands on the, on the animal, and I like this. He says, oh, no, here it comes. It's that time of year again when God calls out to Moses, Vayikra, heralding the beginning of Leviticus. Many readers, especially those who are not anthropologically inclined, are ready to tune out the ensuing litany of animal sacrifices, mm -hmm. bodily emissions, incest laws, and other less than inspiring topics that occupy the Torah portions for several weeks. Indeed, Maimonides himself argued that these laws are relics from an early phase of Israelite civilization, Confirming our suspicion, these rules are primitive. So, so what he's saying there is a nice way of saying everything that I just said, which is, when we get to this, it's it's there's a problem. It's it's an alien world, and and you know it's alien because we don't have these symbols, we don't have these structures, we don't have these these rituals, and and for especially for modern people, we don't have this kind of contact with nature and with life and with the the cycles of life and death and the and the great uh drama of order and chaos notwithstanding the fact that that we are anthropologically speaking living through one of those uh right now on several levels you could talk about the pandemic as one and of course 
the war that's raging now is on the deepest of anthropological levels, a, a, a um, collision of order and disorder, violence and, uh, and humanity. And, uh, and, and we could, it, it's terrifying how, how real all of that is and how that relates to sacrifice. Uh, we will just, uh, I'm not, I'm not, it's not my topic here, but, but it's not far away. It's not far away because sacrifice touches on issues of violence and of course, blood and fire. Okay. And so he focuses, Fader just puts this sentence. I love the sentence is the ritual gestures are primitive, not in the sense of outdated or simplistic, but that they appeal to a more fundamental level of communication whose scope is much wider than verbal language. It is the more primal level of communication, which offers a means for interacting with impersonal forces and states such as sin, guilt, and impurity. Okay. So what he's saying, he's arguing there is that ritual puts into um, a symbolic language, the things that we cannot express in words, not all of us is able to express ourselves articulately. We often need the symbol, the gesture, the, the choreography, uh, to a certain extent, you know, and I would put on the side here, music, which is nonverbal, but which, which conveys states of emotion, um, and ritual, which is the highly ordered series of symbolic events captivates everything that we want to express. Um, in, you know, we because we live in such a secularized world, we, we do not apprehend the, the value of ritual, but rituals do take place in the secular world. And I'll make reference to this in his, you know, later on, which is, you know, we are several months into a new presidency, but the, the ritual of, a, of an inauguration is, is highly specific. It consists of stages of very important symbolic moments, including a symbolic location, including a symbolic oath, including symbolic documents, symbolic acts, um, and, and the like. And, and I think an inauguration is as close as we can get within the American context of a highly ritualized set of, uh, uh, of behaviors that are intended to express what is essentially unexpressible, uh, you know, ineffable about the grandeur, the power, the awe, the reverence, the institutional fortitude, strength, and all of the things that you want to kind of focus in on it, because ritual ultimately does that. Now, if we look at, you know, the, in Jewish context, you know, the, the most uh, available, highly ritualized uh, activity that we have is, I guess, the Seder, which tries to express, you know, so many things in a set of staged activities, namely redemption from slavery, gratitude, awe, reverence, terror, fear, uh, plus joy, and more. So all of that could be, could be uh, uh, applied there. But here we're going to, we're talking about sacrifices. I see there's a chat and, and uh, yeah. Okay, the retiring of a damaged American flag is another one. Yes, indeed. Okay, a highly ritualized activity. And we can, we can come up with the different uh, uh, examples. What is sacrifice and why is it so important? So in order to do this, I want to, um, there was a, a very uh, important illustrated movie. It's almost, um, are you familiar with the movie Waltz with Bashar? It uh, is a, um, it's not a cartoon, what was it, animated kind of movie from Israel, won the Academy Award a while uh, uh, ago. Um, and there was a, a movie by the same producer director uh, called Agadat Hurban. It's now playing on the Khan, the, the Israel national broadcaster website. Uh, this is probably where I have to pause my recording because uh, I'll get taken down. So do my recording here. Okay. So, so we just saw these uh, few minutes of the um, movie Agadat Hurban, which unfortunately I'm not able to put on a YouTube because of copyright purposes. But 
in this in these scenes and i'm just recapitulating for anybody who, who's going to watch this class on youtube in these scenes you have i think a fairly detailed uh animation by by stills of the sacrificial process can i can i get your reaction to this what do you think of that and and are you um proud of your ancestry are you you know how do you relate go ahead ruth <laughs> it's stuff like this that always makes me nervous about when we talk about rebuilding beit hamikdash um it's like mm, I, what is this what we're going to be doing it's like <laughs> um I, I, do people is this what people envision returning to it that that makes me kind of nervous so i want to squeamish I, 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 first of all I, I and i know you got i got the can here but but i want to um, echo that uh amplify that because it ought to make us nervous in the sense that um you know judaism obviously evolved from that and we now worship in in different ways but i want to say this and and this is really one of the themes here you know what's 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 useful about um uh, the animation and and I, I think it would be extremely difficult to do this as a movie um is that the animation allows you to put yourself onto the screen uh, into the frame and imagine yourself there and so what i would say is that that if i was an observer of this uh i would be overwhelmed by the spectacle of it by the awe by the fire by the noise by the sound by the 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 sight of blood by the life and death by and all of that and you can see then once you once you do the leap and 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 for all of us it is a leap a, a tremendous imaginative leap into the world of all of this you you could say wow this this is captivating this is now now for for those people who are immersed in the world of you know imagining sacrifices uh and and studying the mishnas and and uh, and re reciting the the daily sacrificial rites as part of our our daily prayer you know the reality would be overwhelming okay it it would be it would it it's um it's a crisis that they don't have this. I, I mean, our, our problem, you know, as, as removed as we are both from, I think, these kinds of circles and also from p places, you know, people who really kind of, you know, make that imaginative leap on a, on a regular basis is that we do not understand or appreciate the fervor of the sense of 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 the desire for proximity with god we we you know i think the dividing line between you know non-orthodox communities and orthodox communities mm -hmm. and not all orthodox communities let's be honest but maybe ultra orthodox communities is the 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 degree to which we crave desire live with um and have to be animated by the need to be proximate with God at all times and and sacrifice as you saw there with the pomp the ceremony the spectacle the blood the fire and and the the hyper organization around it uh evokes all of that Bob like several comments first that I really appreciate your showing that video because it put a face on some thoughts I had as I was beginning to read this year and I wondered if I throw out the following that of all the parshas that we've read, with the exception of the experience at Mount Sinai, this seems to be the most multi sensory of anything. Absolutely. There's visual, there's auditory, there's Absolutely. tactile, there's olfactory, yes. and all of that. And sort of so that in your table, this is a very experiential thing. And it leads me to two points. Yes. The, the, the first is that I read somewhere that. Uh, in earlier times, but even now, ch children were introduced yes. to look to this through Leviticus. Yeah. And that's where they started, not with Genesis, not with the others. And I'm wondering if that's because of the multi-sensory real world aspects of this. And my final point is that for the millennial generation, 
and others who are all into experiences and experiences. Yes. This is very effective, isn't it? Absolutely. No question about it. I, you know, the, 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 the question as to why, you know, uh, um, why the curricula started with Vayikra, it, it probably has to do with that and, and a few other reasons, uh, including, um, you know, language. There, there are lots of interesting, you know, language um, skills that, that are developed here. It's, it's not that it's um, uh, simple, but it, 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 it does develop a certain language skill. And I think because at the core of Vayikra, it's, it, there's a question. The question is, how do you live as a Jew? And so it, it, it invites from the first word, it invites your response. And so what, what, you know, you're, you're educating a three-year-old, a four-year-old already at the first stage in traditional curricula, you're educating response. I think that that's what it's about. Gitel, Steve, and then Nanette. I see your hand, Nanette, so you can put it up. Okay. Gitel, Steve, and Nanette. So, so oh, first of all, I have to be, I'm on your page, Ruth, and I found it. I, I'm just so glad I don't live in a world where, where this is what goes on. My question, it's, it's just a question. So this only showed the Kohanim involved. Yes. So the average man who came, their families, they were not at all involved. They were, they were not oh. participatory in this. They just gave the, the sheep as a sacrifice. They paid money or they gave the sheep or they did something of the sort, no. but they weren't involved in the whole tactile process. Okay, so, so what we saw there was, was the, the temple daily sacrifice, okay? I, I have another scene in the movie there where it is a person we got a chance. Well, I'll, I'll put that up where, where there is an individual who, who is reciting something as the, the animal gets, uh, gets sacrificed. And that's where an individual, uh, you know, does it. So, so, so what, what, what I, I haven't said, because it's such an encyclopedic subject is that, you know, there's a whole menu of, of sacrifices, as you can see already from the first few chapters of Leviticus, there's a menu of different kinds of and 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 different sacrifices, which are made up of different elements, uh, require different behaviors, including who gets to you know where you where you splatter the blood on. It's highly highly ritualized and detailed activity, and for reasons which uh, we, we'll get to. Steve Parkoff, then Nanette. Okay, Steve, go ahead. You're back. Go. Okay, so. <clears throat> Uh, I'm sorry I was late, but I did see the cartoon that you showed. Yeah. Uh, I didn't hear the rest of the thing before. But what comes to mind is, and I think you can find it on YouTube, I'm not sure. Uh, the Samaritans. Yes. Today, so do the, they do that. I have a sacrifice. And if you watch them, it's a whole deal with the people standing around and they have big pits and they slaughter multiple animals. Right. Hard to and then watch. They cook them. Hard to watch, but but that's the the Samaritan sacrifice. Very good, Nanette. You got your hand up. Go ahead, Nanette. So as you know, Rabbi, and some people, I'm a very strict militant vegan. <laughs> but so I have to look at this with with a modern with a uh, a sense of uh, a modern sensibility. I have to just accept this is what they did back then. Fine, but Rabbi, I'm a little confused. If we as a tribe choose life, I mean, is this choosing life? Uh -huh. Good question. So it's such a fascinating question, and 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 how the Torah relates to this. Um, I, you know, it's it's. I'm trying to put this into into a, a succinct a passage, a, 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 a paragraph as possible, which is in the Torah. The, the worldview is that, um, and I, you know, not, not everyone agrees with me, but, but, but I, I think it's very compelling that the Torah starts out with human beings only eating from the vegetable world, seeds, plants, and fruits, okay? It's only after mm -hmm. the, uh, the flood that human beings are given permission to eat from other living creatures. However, at the beginning of the creation story, human beings are given dominion over animals. Animals are not the same as human beings. They have 
the the uh, human beings have dominion over the animals um and that uh and yet animals are living creatures and so we we organize our consumption of animals based not on the right to eat animals but as a concession to the animal nature of human beings which has a a, a strong desire for flesh because for a simple reason eating cooked flesh of animals is a highly efficient way to provide for your nutrition it has been that way for many many tens of thousands of years now the bible doesn't know from these you know the theory of evolution but, but we do and we know that that human beings part of the reason why human beings became human beings is precisely because they mastered the ability to control fire and to roast flesh of animals and that provided for the exponential growth of the human brain which made for all of us so so in some ways our humanity is really connected to the consumption of animals okay it's veganism and i'm speaking as one is a is a modern phenomenon vegetarianism is not a modern phenomenon but but in the sense of the the idea that we don't want to to harm animals that's actually not a modern phenomenon. The, the, the idea that you could eat meat was only regarded with, you could only eat meat under certain circumstances, under sacred circumstances. And that's why when you read the Bible carefully, you're only supposed to slaughter meat at certain places. And this becomes a, another, another um, dynamic within, within biblical history. People don't want to have to travel all the way to to jerusalem for a hamburger you know they want to eat it locally and so you get sacred slaughter and non-sacred slaughter and from that we develop into the kosher I, I i've said this many times and i'll say it again the way we observe kosher today is based on all of that but but it's so far removed from its original value structure as to almost make it an obsession and 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 that's a crisis in in uh, religious observance but but yes the ideal is veganism the ideal is vegetarianism eating meat is a, is a concession to human uh behavior and human needs okay and the fact that that this uh sacrifice of animals is at the core of religious experience is is a way of trying to evoke uh, the, the, the need to give back something. I'll talk about that shortly. Bob, go ahead. Two additional interpretations I read, and you may have mentioned these before, was that this was also transitional for people coming from Egypt and the sacrifices there, but also for the children, instead of them seeing themselves sacrificed to Moloch, it would be reassuring that it was the animals that were sacrificed rather than the children. So all of, all of that, uh, you know, is, is, it's just part of the mix. Okay. Um, going all the way back to Abraham. Um, and, um, and, and here there's, there's a whole debate within the interpreters of these rituals as to like, what, what's really happening here? You know, when you when you put your hands on the thing, are you trying to say this instead of me? You know, we, we, we do have that conclusion. I don't I don't think that's the right conclusion. Um, but but, you know, in, in some ways it, 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 it becomes part of the way we talk. I'm not really sure why, except for the fact that we, we still kind of do that. Those are, you know, anyone who's ever seen, done or read about the, you know, the Kapora ritual you know, says, says, here's the chicken. Uh, and it's, and, it, and, and that's why people hate, you know, some rabbis really despise the Kapara ritual. I'm trans, you say, this chicken is going to its death, and I'm going to life, which, which makes it very, you know, explicit, you know, you're making, and it's, it's, you're, you're, you're making the chicken vicariously die for you. That that's kind of ridiculous. 
Look so, up for us. Yeah, no, so, so you know, the, the, I, I, I choose to interpret the idea that, you know, you place your hands on the animal as saying, this, it's, it, I, this is not me, but this is mine. There's a difference between something that I own and something that is me. Right? Nobody wants to see themselves burn, okay? But what people do want to see is they want to they wanna see their gift given, okay? And that's going to lead us into, into my discussion here, which is based on the work of uh, uh, the, the philosopher uh, Moshe Halbertal, okay? I'm going to put this up on the screen right now. Moshe Halbertal has a book called On Sacrifice here, uh, so he says, sacrifice is a most primary and basic form of ritual. In the Bible, it begins with Cain and Abel and ends with the destruction of the temple. So you see, there's a whole narrative arc uh, in, in the entire Bible where, uh, you know, the sacrifice, you know, go to chapter already four of the, of the book of Genesis, and there are people sacrificing. Cain sacrifices from the fruit of the soil, but Abel takes from the choicest of the flock. In Judaism, Zarabias came to an abrupt end with the destruction of the temple. You can't imagine, we can't imagine how catastrophic this was, uh, and because it, 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 um, it necessitated a complete reorientation of Judaism. The, the, the temple and the sacrificial ritual solved all the problems. It, 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 it meant that the people were united. It meant that people had a, you know, a constant source of, of engagement. And it meant that, that the dynamic of their proximity and distance from God was always being mediated. Okay. The rabbis sublimated temple sacrifice. That means they, they, they absorb it after, after the destruction of the temple, you can't do it. So, so what they what they did was they made substitutions, and the substitutions are Ruth, the Judaism that we know today, prayer, charity, mitzvot, studying Torah. Christianity did a different thing, and and, and here you have to appreciate historically the nexus point <coughs> of Judaism and rabbinic Judaism and Christianity is almost the same point in history, which is that and sacrifice is at the core of Christianity. Do not underestimate the power of sacrifice because Christians who truly live out the narrative of, of Christianity are living out the narrative of sacrifice all the time. So you're saying, you know, uh, fe, fe, basically, right? But, but that's at the core of a half of the world's, core of the world's population. The idea that God that was sacrificed. Right? What's that? Does that make it right? I mean, no, no, the no. fact that half the world is doing it, it just, it, it, it's, I'm listening very carefully, Rabbi. I read the words of this section of Torah every single year, and every single year I can envision it. I didn't have to see it's the little movie. animated thing that you show. I didn't have to see it. It's there in my head, and I'm thinking to myself, God did not want this, and that's why he eliminated it. God eliminated it. It was time for us to move on and to have a different kind of Judaism. And so we look at it, I look at it historically because I don't like to throw anything out. I don't want to do, I don't want to do that because then we have to relive history and that is not always a good thing I, to do. Look, I, I think we that have that, to move on. It's absolutely, it's a valuable strategy for, for making sense of, of this and putting it into, into it's pretty, what, you're, what you've done basically is say, look, I, I have contextualized it. I'm contextualizing uh -huh. everything, and I read it, and I and what I do when I read, I'm engaging in a historical uh -huh. memory that puts that in context. Uh -huh. I am not that you're saying, and I am not uh -huh. connected to that, nor do I want that, nor does it speak. To, and so all of that. So I I'm I'm going to say I agree to that. I agree to contextualization, and I kind of put, I'm putting a little tint on that, saying, but wait a minute, you know. Let's not underestimate the fact that it captivates a certain part of the human experience. And, and while I'm, I'm back to the Christianity, you know, the, the question you asked was the fact that they do doesn't make it right. It's not the question, in my opinion, not the question with respect. It's, it's the question is, why does the narrative captivate? 
why are people invested with their lives in that narrative? And the answer is because it must speak to something deep in a human being to want to understand that God would give up the most precious thing for God so that we could live. That's a very powerful idea. And, and, uh, and that's why it works. I don't agree with it. It's not my idea. It's not my narrative, not my story. Okay. But look, and here, I mean, this is, it's going to make my, 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 my throat choke. The, 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 the narrative of sacrifice, the narrative of blood and violence, fire, death, salvation is playing out in real time right now, 5,000 miles away. We are seeing it every single second, okay? And the narrative is playing. And, and so what, what, you, what you're reaching for is as a, with religious kind of language, I am asking myself, is there a medium, is there a mechanism that I could stop that? And the answer is, I wish. I don't. And so, you know, it almost says you would reach for anything to stop that. And I think at the core of sacrifice, there was this yearning to direct violence away from intended victims, namely other human <laughs> beings, and to centralize it and to control it within a structure. Yeah, and that is the theory, huh? that's the philosophy of the philosopher René Girard, G-I-R-A-R-D, who has in his book called Violence and the Sacred, says, look, we human beings are constantly in, in conflict with each other. And when you have an outlet, a victim for that conflict, and you can direct all that violence and control it, it preserves human peace. That's a kind of simplification of it, but, but it, it kind of works. Without that structure, everything falls apart. Now you could argue, even with the structure, everything falls apart and everything did fall apart. So the structure is not perfect, obviously, but the structure worked for as long as it worked until, until the world changed. And the world changed in antiquity because of the great powers that existed. Rome in the second temple came to Jerusalem and said, yeah, sure, no, that's it, end of story. And they destroyed it. And, and as, as, um, as difficult as it was, and you know, any of us who have been to Jerusalem and seen it, you know, can't imagine how, how did they manage to burn and destroy the whole thing. Uh, it's, they did because power and force can do that. And unfortunately also, you know, as painful as it, we're, we're just seeing that now with, with brutal, unrepentant, un, un, unmitigated force, you can crush civilization. And that's the greatest tragedy that's unfolding right now. Okay. So here's the, here's uh, sacrifice. It's about a gift. And what's the, the core of this is the, is the basic desire to be accepted. When you have Cain and Abel, it's Cain wants to be accepted. And you see in that story what happens when he wasn't. He was devastated. Here's the text. You know the text. Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Hevel brought to God regard for Hevel, but Cain and his gift had no regard. Cain being exceedingly upset and his face fell. And what that story is about is is the ultimate in rejection, okay? So, so here we are as human beings. We want to live with God. We want God, the most important thing that we want in the divine human relationship is for God to pay attention to us, okay? And the, the modality, the instrumentality for that in that time was sacrifice. Not in our time, but in that time it was for the reasons that I will explain in a second. The act of sacrifice anticipates creating a bond between the giver and the receiver. The reception of a gift establishes continuity of the gift cycle. So I, I put this in, 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 in human terms, which is the, the easiest example of this is when you're invited to someone's house for a dinner, you know, the, the etiquette is that you come, you come in with a little gift, okay? 
what's the gift? The gift is, you know, a tchotchke, a bottle of wine, a, you know, a piece of fruit or whatever. It's nothing. But in, it's the idea of presenting something as an act of gratitude in, in, in anticipation for what you're going to receive. And so within the gift process, there is a, an economy, so to speak, a cycle that goes on. And the, the cycle is reinforced through this modality of giving and receiving, okay? And those of you who have ever been in the experience of a, on, the, on the receiving end, know how, how you now have an obligation to say thank you, right? And that thank you functions as a gift to recycle within the whole system, okay? And you also know, as many of us know, that when your gift is rejected, okay? If you give something and the person that you give it to doesn't like it, it is, uh, well, I don't, you don't want to say traumatic? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an insult, it's painful. It's, and you know, if, it, if, if it's to God, it's traumatic. If it's to my neighbor, it's not, I, I can live with it, okay? If my neighbor rejects my box of cookies, okay. Which is why, by the way, you know, there's, there's a lot of dancing and delicacy that goes on when you give a gift, right? You know, and people, especially because of kashrut or whatever, you know, people are very, very apprehensive. Should I give it? Oh, it's going to eat it. It's not going to eat it. What's going to happen? And so the apprehension is almost subsumes the act of giving altogether, okay? So what Moshe Havotel writes is that sacrifice is, to, is almost to be on the edge. It's, it's I'm giving, but I understand that I'm attempting to express something and that expression comes with a tremendous risk. And that risk, risk is rejection. The risk of rejection is always present. And as a human being, I always want to be accepted. I don't want to be Cain. It's devastating to be Cain. Okay, and I don't. And the Bible doesn't explain why why Cain is rejected. Okay, every attempt to explain it is a failure. But but the point is that that he is rejected, and it's devastating. And civilizationally, it has it changes civilization that he was. Okay. A present mincha is is uh, contains within it the inherent potential of rejection. Mincha, when we say a mincha, it means to halania, to place before. But korban, which is the language of our text, korban is about coming close. Karev. I, I can't avoid that. That that the word for sacrifice is not the, it's not the same as making sacred it's i want to be close and and the effect of this instrumentality the animal is to make me bonded and to make me close the, what happens when you give the receiver decides whether to take or give and there's a crucial gap between giving and receiving so here i'm you know the giver and the receiver and, and the potential of right rejection is in the gap between the two and I want to say, you have to mind the gap, okay? A matana is a gift between equals. But when you're unequal, the superior has the privilege of rejecting it. For the superior to accept the gift of the inferior, it's an act of love. The superior is not under any obligation to accept. And so it's a total love that enables the, the sovereign, the king, the God, to accept. So a sacrifice is an attempt to elicit that love. Sacrifice is basically an act of returning. Cain gave the produce in the first place. God is entitled to accept or reject it, its return. God, sorry, God gave the produce. So God, you know, in this, in this worldview, fruit comes out of the soil because of God. So what Cain wants to do is just give back. It's just returning, okay? So, and this is the philosophy of Marcel Mauss. Right. Jacob, we have two examples of this. Jacob says, I want, you know, you're, I, I'm leaving. And if you give me everything, when I come back, I'll give you a tithe. Hannah, 
if you grant me a child, I'll let I'll give you the child. So I, you give it to me, and I'll give it back to you. And so we make a conditional cycle of reciprocity based on giving and receiving. And since the sacrifice comes out of the animal world, which is the world that God gives us, we are giving it back. And since the modality of giving back to God includes putting it in smoke and sending it to heaven, that's what happens with sacrifice. So, so the narrative that's going on, the story behind sacrifice is simply a story of desire. It's a desire to be close and a desire to give back, right? We see, I mean, hear this all the time. You know, people, you know, live a good life. They say, all I want to do is give back. All I want to do is give. I've been blessed. I've been blessed. I've been blessed. All I want to do is give back. It's a fundamental human desire. I want to give, right? I, I'm thankful. I'm, I'm grateful. Or a fundamental human emotion, which is I'm terrified. And I need to, I need to, I need to get into God's good graces. I need to, I need to make that bond work. I don't want to be rejected. The greatest trauma in my life is to be rejected. Okay, I'll stop here. Susan, go ahead. Yeah, so th this is a theme in um, uh, Tolkien's trilogy of, of gift giving and receiving. So, you know, uh, one person can give a particular object, your person A can be, give a, an object to person B, and person B gives the same object to person C when he goes to visit him. And person C, then at a later time, he can give it back to person A. And it doesn't matter that this one object keeps circulating because the the the, uh, the car is the giving and the receiving. Exactly. So 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 what 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 he's saying, I don't know the books well, but but that there is a cycle here. That's Marcel Maus. Go ahead, Ruth. So interestingly, I mean, we're talking about a sacrifice as a gift and, and whatever, yet in modern Hebrew, korban has become um, completely negative. Korban is a victim. Yeah. A korban is something you do definitely not want to be. Um, and I kind of, you know, rather than seeing these animals as uh, gifts, they, you know, they're they're the this victims. Is, this is, this, so this is this is language. This is the evolution of language and how how words take on different meanings. Um, and and you're absolutely right. And and Halbertel in this book discusses that. The whole second part of the book is about that very very idea, where where you know he he, he calls it sacrificing to and sacrificing for, right? And that you you when you sacrifice for you end up you know you are you are you become, or you can be called a victim. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, I, I touched on it earlier in the sense that, that, you know, when you lay like in Israel, when, um, when soldiers fall in a war, they're called korbanot, right. And, and it, it ought to leave us with a certain unease that, that, but, but anthropologically speaking, it there's there's a whole unity of narrative here which is the life of the nation depends on the sacrifice of individuals and that that is as visceral as it gets i put my life on the line to save the people and so when a soldier is killed in battle right or uh killed even in an accident that that is seen as part of the larger context. And look, you know what's playing itself out right now in Ukraine is here are you know thousands and thousands of people who are returning, coming, whatever, taking up arms because they feel that um, they're they need to sacrifice their lives for the sake of their country, even at the overwhelming odds that they are now faced, because they understand that. Uh, life under the oppression is not worth living, and that and that's this is kindled nobility and 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 awe and and it terrifies us. I mean, we're all we're all living in a moment of of real terrify ter terror on this. Okay. Uh, okay, I, I I know we're over, but but I have just a couple of things. Sacrifice funny as a token of submission and gratitude. And so you have the Ola, which is chapter one, 
which is the pure gift, okay? And you have the example of the Ola, right? And, and I, I love the details of it, but I but, uh, can't go into it all now. Uh, the Akeda as, as an example of the, uh, the, an Ola, but it's an Ola that is very, very different and strange and an Ola that goes wrong. Okay, so, so just to end this with here, what he talks about is that it's highly ritualized. R giving is ritual activity. And the reason why it's ritualized is because you want to make sure it works. Ritual guarantees the success of transfer. Highly ritualized gift giving is, is necessary. And I want, to, I want to show you an example of this. Just we got two seconds uh, 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 to, to do this because, um, I'm sorry, uh, with um, uh, the... Um, Here's, here's a perfect example of ritual gift lady, giving. Madam Vice President, oh. and our very first second yes. gentleman. I'm sorry, uh, on behalf second, just a second. Uh, the American people, it is our honor to present these custom-made... Hang on, hang on. Do this again. Share screen. Boom. 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 And then I'll just make this regular speed. <laughs> so this is a ritual gift. Good. Um, Mr. President, First Lady, Madam Vice President, and our very first second gentleman, uh, on behalf of the American people, it is our honor to present these custom-made crystal vases commemorating your historic inauguration. Uh, Lennox, uh, which you know is a great company, American company, has handcrafted these gifts for the past nine presidential inaugurations. Uh, it is a good thing I don't have to hand them to you personally. They each weigh with the base 32 pounds, but combined 64. Oh. But Jill, I know, is very strong and could, like, take them both. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, but the Lennox company is actually based in Bristol, Pennsylvania, uh, which you know, Mr. President, is a mere 132 miles from Scranton. Since we know today all roads lead to Scranton, uh, the team at Lennox has worked for months to capture the spirit of this inauguration and your incoming administration. Um, Mr. President, your base features the White House and Vice President Harris's features the U.S. Capitol. Uh, the gifts represent the hope and the faith the American people have placed in you to move our country forward. Okay. I, I put that as an example. It's a, it's a stunning example of, uh, I mean, it's, you, you, I'm putting it in the frame of, it's a highly ritualized moment where there's, there's a kind of subtext here. It's not transactional. It's certainly out of honor and respect, but, but it, if it's, it, is, it is intended to establish hold that, the, hold baseline, hold on, the baseline of the relationship, hold on, hold. a relationship in which there is, it's not equal. The president has more power than the, the, the than Congress, okay, uh, than the congressional leaders. So, so in a way, it's a gesture to entreat the subordinates to the larger power, and it's received in this setting with the virus, in in, in with grace and with affection. He's under no obligation to receive it, right? But it would ruin the moment if he said, ah, you know, I'm not gonna, like it would, it would be, a, it, it, that would be silly, obviously. So there's, there's a dance that's going on and it's a reciprocity. He, they are giving them symbols of hope and he is receiving it and under, with humility, understanding the, the, what is invested in him and that he needs to deliver for them. And of course, you know, we all know that that when they get into the room, it's it's a bloodletting, okay? But you know, in turn, when it when it really works, you know, people argue and people you know negotiate and and it can be you know complicated. But but here, this is the creation of an ordered world within the the a, a situation that is, as we know, potentially chaotic and disastrous, okay? That's what the moment means on the deepest anthropological level, okay? Don't think it's only about the crystal. It's not. 
This is about order and chaos. The order of the functioning government of respect and relationship behind or in front of the chaotic turmoil of all sorts of politics, okay? Now, the sacrifice also functions in exactly the same way. It is to take the chaotic world of nature and the, the life and death and to structure it and put it into a framework so that the individual worshiper can interact with that world and be uh, ennobled by it through the act of giving, but also come right to the boundary of life and death in witnessing the, the, the death of the animal, its blood, and its remains sending up to God. Okay, that's the, that's the best I could do on this. I've gone over, but anybody, anyway, hey, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, just two things. One is the other thing I find moving in this is the fact that everybody's sacrifice matters, no matter if you're rich or you're poor, they're all accepted. And the last thing was uh, a lovely comment. You didn't want to talk about the Aleph, yeah. but one of the things I ran across was uh, what the Aleph letter could mean from uh, one of the Rebbe's yeah. who said, if you think of the Yud on the top and the Yud at the bottom, you have the wisdom and knowledge of God in the Torah, the wisdom of humans, and the slash in between is us. So we're like water carriers carrying and bringing those things together. It's beautiful. Always the symbology of, of the symbolism of that uh, and the humility of that and, and, and so many other uh, you know, related interpretations. Okay. Wow. I didn't even touch the surface. Okay. And, and you can see how exhausting it is. Uh, but, but, um, and, and that's, I guess I want to underscore it's important. This is, this is, we, we can't, we can't just gloss over. I'm, I, I, I feel I'm in the category of people that would like to kind of like, go directly to the book of numbers okay <laughs> or directly to chapter 19 of book of exodus all the the holiness laws love your neighbor etc i don't need the first you know 12 chapters 14 chapters about you know sacrifices and uh, diseases etc it's not my world but but you can see it it speaks to every single ounce of humanity that we all have and with that we will leave it there